All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Vivek Shetty, and on behalf of the MD2K Center based at the University of Memphis, I want to invite you all to today's uh, uh, webinar, uh, which is a uh, very interesting complement to the previous uh, webinar by Professor Jim Ray on first person vision. Our speakers today are Professor Deepak Ganeshan from the Department of Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And uh, he will be uh, co-presenting with his graduate researcher, Addison Mayberry, uh, who is also in the College of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Amherst. Uh, Professor Ganeshan and, uh, and uh, Addison are working on a very interesting uh, eyeglass form factor platform called iShadow, and I want to turn it over to them with a warm welcome. Uh, Professor Ganesh. Thank you. So, um, so thank you for uh, coming on the webinar, and um, so we, you know, as, and thank you Vivek for the introduction. So, um, Addison and I are going to be talking about uh, a device called iShadow that we've been working on for a few years. Um, and you know, this is the abbreviated title here. I found that the original title was a bit too long to fit in two lines, but essentially what this is is, an, uh, is a computational eyeglass. Um, so it's, it's uh, intended to be uh, similar to a regular pair of spectacles um, with the difference that it also continuously measures parameters of the eye in the natural environment. And so when we started on this project a few years back, it was based on the observation that, um, you know, as you all know, there's a lot of different types of wearables in the market for measuring activity patterns, um, physiological signals of various sorts, but there isn't one that measures the eye. Um, and there's a lot of literature that, sh that suggests that you might want to actually measure the eye in the natural environment. Um, you know, there's about a hundred year, uh, you know, more than a century, uh, of clinical work, uh, observational and with uh, with clinical devices that look at the eye and look at movement patterns of the eye as well as other you know different types of um, uh, behaviors in the eye and 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 try to um, infer uh, you know things about the individual based on those patterns and everything from uh, you know everything from sort of the neurological disorders because other than EEG perhaps uh, the eye is perhaps the best window that one has uh, into the human brain. So it's natural that the eye, is, the signals of the eye would correlate uh, to a large extent with, uh, you know, several types of neurological disorders, but also behavioral patterns um, uh, and, uh, you know, different types of health conditions. So, but, but you know, uh, so, so from a, you know, in the clinical setting, um, there are devices that, very, you know, many hospitals have, many research labs have, where one measures the eye. Um, but that technology has not made the transition from the clinical sphere to the public sphere. So there isn't, the, the lab to field transition has not happened. And uh, there are some very good reasons for this, and I will get, get into these reasons um, shortly. But, but basically, the technology turns out to be pretty complicated, and that's the, the short word. So, so essentially what I'll do, what we'll do in this uh, webinar is, um, you know, describe uh, the device that we have designed. And, uh, uh, you know, I start from the top level by describing some of the things you can do with the device and some of the uh, sort of the signals that you can extract um, from the eyeshadow device today. Um, and also sort of describe the history as to why those signals might be interesting and what research, clinical research has happened in the past suggest that that signal might be of value. And uh, so what, you know, midway through the presentation, I'll transition to uh, Addison, who will talk about the guts of it, you know, how exactly this technology work and how we, you know, manage to bridge that, uh, you know, the, the lab to field gap uh, in trying to make this actually practical in uh, everyday settings. So, so just to cut to the chase, uh, the, our current version of shadow has a power consumption of roughly um, you know, around seven milliwatts or so. And perhaps what's impressive about that is really the, the, uh, that it's two orders of magnitude less than what you would consider a state of art in terms of um, uh, uh, 
you know, in terms of a camera-based device, a wearable camera-based device. So Google Glass uh, was about two orders of magnitude more, consumed two orders of magnitude more power than uh, our device. The Tobi is a pretty popular, um, uh, you, you know, uh, sort of a eye tracker platform um, that's used by various researchers, and we are also about two orders of magnitude lower power than that or more. So, so that's that's the gap in terms of the technology side. Uh, we get pretty good uh, gaze tracking accuracy, about half a degree or so, and and fairly high frame rates, which in some cases are useful for certain. Systems. So that's that's where we are. Um, uh, and and uh, you know what I'll start with is talking about different things you can extract from this device, different types of signals you can extract. Um, starting with uh, you know with what got me started on this, which was I read this book a few years back. Um, some of you might have seen it, you know, called Thinking Fast and Slow by Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, and uh, he talks in great depth about some really fascinating um, experiments uh, that they did with. Uh, I, you know, particularly with with pupil dilation back in the 60s, um, where it, you know, he showed among other things. One of the things he showed um, is is shown on the right there, which is that the, you know, you can if you give a math, uh, you know, a, a computational problem to someone and uh, measure the dilation of the pupil, you will see that depending on the com the, the hardness of that problem and uh, you know, the pupil dilation, the extent of pupil dilation actually varies. Um, so there's a direct connection between kind of the workload, um, the mental workload, which later became, uh, you know, came to be referred to as cognitive load. So there's a connection between cognitive load and pupil dilation. Um, and he uh, and some of his collaborators, as well as others in, in this area uh, called pupilometry, which sort of he, I think he and a few others spawned, um, did some fascinating work on looking at pupil dilation and how it relates to cognitive load and behaviors, personality traits, uh, and so on and so forth. And so this is an example of what, uh, you know, from the eyeshadow device, um, you know, how we extracted this is, so as you, you, what you see here is, um, you know, is, is what the pupil dilation, uh, the circles around the pupil itself, the dilation measure, is shown in green. That's what's being extracted from the eyeshadow platform. Now, there's a couple of things you might note from this video. Um, one is, you know, you should ignore the flashing dots and the lines for now, and uh, it will become clear as to what exactly those flashing dots mean when we get into the actual techniques used. Um, but and you should also perhaps you'll also note that these this video doesn't look, uh, you know, like it doesn't look like a very good. Uh, sort of video of the eye. I mean, you can. It's not a HD quality video, and that is intentional um, in the sense that in order to reduce power, you have to actually use, uh, you know, you have to use cameras that may not have the same level of accuracy and same level of fidelity or uh, resolution as a uh, cell phone class HD or or even a VGA camera that you might be used to. But despite that, you can see that the the pupil is actually extracted quite quite well from that. From the signal. Um, another interesting measure of the eye that um, is uh, the saccadic movements of the eye. And again, saccadic movements of the eye have been studied for many decades. Um, and uh, in particular, in relation to uh, cognitive uh, impairment. So uh, that could be, you know, what's shown on the left is um, eye movement patterns for a dyslexic child. So Typical eye movement patterns. If you see a, you know, if you're reading or if you're seeing a straight line, uh, follows the line. Um, but for dyslexic uh, people and dyslexic kids in particular, you you'll see that the, there's a lot of uh, sort of jumping around in terms of the eye movement patterns. And so the the general theme, the general idea that eye movement, saccadic pa patterns of the eye, saccadic movements, where saccades basically refers to sort of these uh, the the sharp movements of the eye. Um, saccadic movements of the eye have been shown to relate to a lot of different types of cognitive in impairment. So, what's on the what's the, the the grid? I suppose on the on the right there um, has a lot of acronyms. So you'll have to bear with me there. But these acronyms correspond to different types of uh, neurological diseases. So um, neurological conditions. So uh, uh, AD corresponds to Alzheimer's. HD uh, Huntington's. 
PD corresponds to Parkinson's, uh, you know, and, and there's various others, you know, MND is motor neuron disease and so on and so forth. So all of these uh, FTD is frontotemporal dementia and so on. So these are, these are kind of the different uh, types of neurological you know, disorders. And uh, what's in the uh, axis there is showing where eye movements are useful, um, uh, you know, in order to either measure progression of the disease or in some cases as a diagnostic test as well. So in, in many of these cases um, where, uh, you know, particularly where motor activity may not, may not sort of indicate the disease, eye movements tend to be pretty useful. So, uh, you know, the frontal dementia, temporal dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, even uh, sort of Huntington's and so on and so forth. So, so there's a literature on, on saccadic movements of the eye. And more recently, uh, sort of there's some really fascinating work on micro saccadic movements of the eye. Um, and micro saccadic movements are these small movements that the eye makes when it's actually fixated and, and, and staring and when you're staring in a single spot. So it's not the, it's not the large movements of the eye, it's the, it's the small movements of the eye. And historically people haven't sort of had the resolution of the technology um, uh, to really understand what saccades, micro saccades mean. And, and there's a lot of interesting work uh, by Martinez Conde and others on, on trying to sort of uh, look at micro saccadic movements. But what's fascinating about micro saccades is that it um, actually uh, uh, provides a measure of, of various things uh, you know that one might be interested in, including uh, they had a, they had work in saying that uh, for medical residents, um, the micro saccadic movements uh, changed whether when they were pre-call versus post-call. So so it could have relevance to understanding uh, things like fatigue in in um, you know, among residents, um, but also among other kinds of groups, right? So, and and uh, again, it was also used to, just as pupil dilation could measure mental workload, they showed that microsaccadic movements could also uh, provide a proxy for mental workload. And the advantage of microsaccades in the field is that it doesn't really require uh, you to do any uh, specific test. It might be, you know, just when somebody's fixated, you could look at the microsaccadic patterns and perhaps use that as a diagnostic tool. And uh, so, so micro saccades can be extracted from eyeshadow. So here's a video that shows um, kind of eye movements uh, from a, from a particular, uh, you know, from Addison here actually. So when he was wearing the eyeglass, so you can see uh, sort of the the device um, eyeshadow is picking up all these these movements, large, large movements, small movements, and so on. So this is just to sort of illustrate how uh, our uh, you know device might be useful in extracting saccadic and micro saccadic um, movement patterns. So uh, another interesting measure, which um, has been studied a fair bit, is uh, blinks and and just uh, just sort of um, you know um, the eye closure patterns. And as you might imagine, um, this is uh, you know incredibly useful for uh, in in sort of drowsy driving scenarios and and preventing accidents on the road. Uh, and so no surprise that some of the earliest work on sort of trying to understand how blink patterns can be used and eye closure patterns can be used were actually from the Department of Transportation. And so back in the early 90s, they uh, came up with a measure called per class, percentage of eye closures, um, which they defined as the proportion of time the eyes are closed, about 80 to 100% of the iris. Um, and so they came up with this, the, the figure here on the right uh, shows uh, something from, from, the, from 1994 where they said, you know, the per class measure is shown in the uh, Y axis. And and they showed that, they said that the different states of the, um, the individual in terms of whether they were drowsy, or whether they were awake, or whether they were in an in-between state could be measured based on the per class measure. And uh, so so per class is actually, um, you know, there are there are devices, there are, you know, there are some of the high-end uh, vehicles today incorporate um, sort of built-in eye trackers that are there on the dashboard. They work okay, depending on the lighting conditions and so on. But the point is they, they actually uh, try to extract per class um, as, the, as the validated measure of, of drowsiness. And, you know, our, you know the, the, on the left here is showing sort of different states of the eye from our device. But, but I think the main point is, uh, is on this graph here. So what, what we show here on the, on the upper side is the, is the number of blinks and the eye itself. And, um, 
below you will see the actual patterns of the ice. So, so you can see uh, the graph below shows um, sort of what we are in extracting uh, from the eye shadow in terms of the actual uh, eye closure patterns. And uh, and the line and the figure on the, the top, the video on the top, with the line shows where where the algorithm is actually um, uh, inferring as the, as the state of the, uh, the upper eyelid. And you can see that it's reasonably robust to changes in um, the position of the eye. Um, and as you will see shortly, uh, it's also somewhat, you know, it's also quite robust in terms of, uh, you know, to the position of the eyelid, even if somebody were looking down um, um, with small closures. And, and, and you see, uh, you know, so some of you might have noticed that there's actually three lines on the video shown on the top. Um, uh, you know, two vertical lines and one horizontal line. And uh, this might become a little bit more clear uh, when I ex when we get into the um, the way the algorithm works. But the point being that we actually don't need to take the we don't need to measure the entire video in order to extract um, the blink patterns. Uh, all we do is sample is is extract two lines, uh, two two sampled vertical uh, sets of pixels. Um, and so that's the, that's part of the reason why we can do this in real time at low power. All right, so that's blinks. And another measure uh, that actually gets into the first person vision that that uh, Vivek uh, described, and also first person vision that uh, that Jim Ray might have talked about last uh, in the in the last webinar is gaze and and gaze patterns. So so where are people looking at in the real world? Um, and uh, gaze patterns again have many uses. Um, uh, many applications of which I think uh, Jim uh, alluded to um, in terms of looking at uh, exposure to advertisements and so on. Um, you know, following through from the road example, um, gaze patterns have utility in understanding. Uh, you know, where people pay attention in in their uh, in their sphere and how people might make mistakes. Um, it could be used for medical mistakes, for example, or other. You know, it could be used in other scenarios uh, other than and driving. Um, but the the idea being that that where you pay attention to and how you pay attention, whether you're an experienced driver versus a novice driver, and perhaps an experienced surgeon versus a novice surgeon, um, it could be interesting to look at. Uh, in you know in the in in um, uh, autism spectrum disorder, people have found extensive evidence uh, about how how um, typically developing children versus children with ASD tend to look. Uh, Typically, developing children tend to look at the eyes, um, focus on the face a lot more, whereas if, if you're autistic, they tend to focus away from it. So there's a lot of interesting things one can do with gaze. Now, this video is actually taken uh, very early. We didn't have time to uh, sort of do it again. So this this isn't sort of the latest and greatest from the device, but it gives you an idea of what we can do. Um, so this is the X kind of represents where uh, where the person is looking. Um, and the video on the left is the outside world, and the video from the right is the eye-facing camera. So, so the uh, you know you might also notice that the video on the left doesn't show you know it isn't a very nice sort of HD camera that we have, and so our you know the our device eyeshadow is designed to be very low power, and so as a consequence, um, one of the things we actually sacrifice is the fidelity, is the resolution. Um, so in certain applications, the resolution is reasonable. <laughs> Um, but in other applications, one might want, um, you know, more fidelity from the outward facing camera. All right. So um, there are many other things one could do with, um, um, you know, with a device like eyeshadow, which we haven't not done yet. For example, there's been very recent um, and interesting work on looking at it, looking at eye movement patterns uh, as a diagnostic tool for concussion. In particular, sort of looking at the uh, you know the coordinated eye movements between the left and the right eye. Typically, you would see the eye movements be uh, coordinated. Um, so on the up, on the top, you'll see that move, the eye movements of the left and the right eye are generally coordinated and sitting on top of each other. But post concussion, which is a big issue after injuries, you know, sports injuries in particular, post con concussion, it turns out. That... Okay, great. Um, so I think somebody would have to be muted in one of the. Um, audio. All right. So, so moving on. So, uh, uh, you know, but the the bottom uh, graph here shows concussion 
um, uh, you know, the, the left and the right eye don't don't quite move in synchrony uh, after concussion. And so, uh, an interesting use case for these kinds of devices um, is is to is is as a diagnostic tool for concussion. Right now, we don't have the cameras on both sides, but that can be done fairly easily. Okay, so um, uh, you know that that sort of gives you a flavor of uh, what one can do, um, you know, with this kind of device. Um, and uh, you, you know, and and sort of the 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 kinds of work that's gone on in the past in the clinical sphere, and how that might translate to what we might do in the uh, in the field. But as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a problem in the sense that you know that eye trackers are not really designed for being wearable. Um, uh, you know, in 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 top, you know, in in regular natural uh, conditions, and that you know we have a natural device. I mean, many people wear spectacles, and so it seems like a natural device for us to um, stick in all of the electronics and and uh, to, and the algorithms that we want. We've certainly accomplished that quite nicely in the context of uh, wristbands. And I mean, smartwatches are everywhere, and almost virtually anybody can start of start building one of these. But that hasn't happened uh, for eye trackers. And if you look at the state of art eye trackers out there, uh, you'll see they actually come with uh, an external battery pack and a data storage uh, module. Um, they're data loggers for most part, uh, and they have about a few hours of operating time, two to four hours, depending on how how heavily it's used. Um, and and so the question is why, right? Why is it so power hungry, and what is, what are the gaps in Sort of going from that kind of a device to something that's actually sort of completely embedded in a regular pair of spectacles. And so, if you dig down, you'll see the following. So, uh, you'll see that uh, generally these eye trackers uh, have cameras, one or more. Um, they're getting VGA quality data, so that's uh, uh, you know 640 by 480 pixel uh, you know color video. Uh, that generates a lot of data. If you're doing 30 frames per second, that's already a megabyte of data. Uh, some of the commercial eye track, some of the you know lab-based eye trackers that I mentioned uh, actually go up to 500 uh, frames per second. So that is a huge amount of data that you're 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 um, you're sampling and sensing. And then now consider the computation that it requires to actually process that data. Right? If you want to do video processing on that data, that is a massive amount of computation. And if you want to run algorithms in real time, like eye tracking algorithm, that is additional uh, heavy duty computation on that. Right. So, so with all that said, it doesn't, you know, it's not that surprising that these devices are high power. So you need external battery pack, you know, external um, batteries to run them, <coughs> and that also limits their lifetime. So, what do we do about this? And so, um, you know, what should be clear here is that the problems start at the source. You're generating way too much data. So this is a drill down uh, into kind of what it might look like from the camera to the, the processor. You have a camera that's that's an array of pixels. Right? So it's a matrix of pixels. Uh, that's a rough approximation of a camera. And you're generate a generating a huge amount of pixel data. You're uh, amplifying that data. You're digitizing it. And then you have to process it. Right? So, and, and you cannot solve this problem uh, just at the computational end. Right? You cannot solve it just by having better algorithms. Because no matter how good your algorithms are, if you're if you have a few megabytes of data streaming in, that's a lot of work you have to do. Right? So so the big hammer uh, in all of our work with this device is basically saying, well, let's push it all the way down so that we're reducing how much data you're acquiring directly from uh, the sensor. So if you can find a way to sample as few pixels as possible from the camera, when I mean few, I mean you know. A few hundreds of pixels, right? Very small number of pixels from the camera. Then you're actually reducing everything, the work that needs to be done for every stage of the pipeline. After that, you're digitizing less, you're processing less, um, and that that you know that has potential to actually push the power consumption down, the complexity of the device down. So that is the essential idea. So um, we started off with, uh, you know, we we found a, a clinical, uh, a, a commercial partner actually, Sentai, um, and we've been working with them since, uh, and they they've been giving us these uh, sort of random access pixel cameras. Um, these random access pixel cameras are cameras which are very different from traditional cameras. Which traditional cameras you only get a whole image at a time, but these cameras you can you can sample particular pixels. Um, 
and they're also fairly low power in the sense that they consume a few milliwatts. Uh, but the, con the the negatives are there. They give you these noisy images. They're low resolution. Um, so so we had to you know we had to deal algorithmically with uh, these problems, um, but take advantage of the random ex uh, random access capability to sample specific pixels. So we had the device, um, and the but the question we were faced with is uh, you know so we have this uh, we have this device we have this camera that's capable of doing what we kind of want to do. We have this idea that we have to sample a few pixels as few pixels as possible, uh, but we also have the problem that we have to extract useful sort of uh, uh, markers or measures from the eye um, from this limited amount of data. So how do we do it? So at this point, I'm going to transition to Addison. We'll talk about the guts of the algorithm. All right, thanks, Deepak. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So m moving forward. Um, so yeah, as Deepak said, our primary method um, to get low power out of this device while still getting good eye tracking accuracy is to subsample out of the image. Um, so what we want to do is find the pixels in the image that make the most sense or the most informative for the task at hand. So for example, what you see on the screen right now is if you want to find the amount of pupil dilation or the size of the pupil, then obviously the kind of pixels you're going to want to sample are going to be the ones at the boundary between between the pupil and the iris because everything else is more or less irrelevant and even like the pixels inside the pupil itself won't give you too much information. You want to harness the, the circular structure of the pupil and leverage that as much as you can. Uh, so one of our initial challenges once we kind of had this insight was how to do this process automatically. Uh, and so we went with a machine learning model uh, called a neural network that probably most everyone has heard of at this point. They've become extremely popular in the last few years especially. Um, but I'm just going to give a brief overview of how they work for those who may not be as familiar. Um, so like all machine learning models, you're going to start with an input. In our case, it's pixels from an image. Um, in this representation of a neural network that I'm using, they, the, these pixels get fed into what's called an input unit, which is effectively just um, a storage um, for these separate values. They get multiplied together with a set of weights, um, and these are just Again, standard weights that we will learn during the training process. And those get summed together into what are called hidden units, which is really the crux of the model. And what these are, um, and what you can think of them intuitively as, is they, during the learning process, learn a template over the input units. And then they'll match, um, when you're doing the prediction task, they'll match the inputs against those templates and run them through a nonlinearity, uh, depending on the specifics of it depend on your application and the type of model you're using. Um, but the long and short of it is it'll match this template, run it through, and then that'll give you your outputs. Um, so you can see here, this is a, sam a sample of a template from one of our initial data sets. And this is actually taken and trained on some eye images, like the ones at the top of the screen. Uh, you can see, by and large, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, and that's pretty normal with these things. But what you can kind of see is that this region here um, you can see there's a little bit more structure there. It's got a little more weight assigned to the pixels in that area, which makes sense when you look at a picture of the eye. Um, uh, so intuitively, what's happening is it's focusing its attention on the region where the eye actually is. Um, it's learning just with standard supervised training methods that these pixels are the ones that are the most relevant to what I'm trying to learn. So from there, in a standard model, um, you multiply these hidden units against a set of output weights. And those get combined together to form your outputs. And for us, it's just the simple two numbers, an X and a Y coordinate. Um, and we've used this in a couple different ways. Specifically, we've used the X and the Y to refer to sometimes the position of the pupil or the center of the pupil in a eye video. Or you could also use it as the gaze target in an egocentric video like the ones that uh, Jim presented previously. And so the big reason that we chose to go with neural networks is that uh, in order to do the prediction, all you have to do is basically flow data across this graph that I'm showing here, which by and large is just simple multiplications and additions. Uh, the training part's a little more involved as it often is, but that you can do offline beforehand. And I'll discuss exactly what that process looks like with a real user um, towards the end of the talk. I've addressed the type of model we're using and how it can learn to do eye tracking. I still haven't yet discussed how we can use it to do um, inference on what, which pixels in the image are the most valuable and which ones we should harvest. Um, so the general machine learning technique 
that would deal with this is referred to as regularization. And that just refers to a class of techniques by which you force a model during training to uh, effectively throw away some of its inputs or only use uh, some fraction of it, the inputs or the features that are available to it. Um, so I'm going to delve into the math just a little bit. So normally, you're, um, whenever you're training a model, you're training some function like this, and you're trying to minimize its value. Um, you'll always have this first term, which is the, the error, in our case, a squared error. And that's very simple. It's just the difference between what the network currently predicts and what it was supposed to predict. And you'll try to minimize that um, by adjusting the weights. And the second term is the regularization term. And what this is, is it will um, return a higher value the more input features you use or the more pixels you use. So if it's trying to minimize this entire function and minimizing the sparsity along with it, it's going to try and throw out um, whatever pixels it can without hurting the error too much. And then we have this um, one parameter, lambda, that's the one knob you can turn to kind of trade off between better accuracy and higher sparsity. And so again, here's some data from our initial data sets. Um, so what you're looking at, let me break it down for you, is as we um, uh, turn up the, the sparsity and decrease the number of pixels, how does the neural network respond? So what you can see, let's see, so the masks across the middle will show you the assignments of the pixels that the neural network chose as we increase the regularization. Um, the, across the top is the error um, in gaze prediction corresponding to that specific mask. And then at the bottom is the number of pixels it chooses. So you can see, just looking at the, the images of the masks, that it's very quickly just immediately throwing away all of the pixels corresponding to the skin and the parts of the eye that don't move. And then as you crank up the regularization even further, it starts honing in on um, the even more salient features like the boundary between the iris and the white or the location of the pupil, things like that, which is intuitively what we as humans would do. Um, and the really cool thing is that if you look at the, how the number of pixels decreases, it goes down from left to right by two orders of magnitude, whereas the gaze error barely, it doesn't even double. So we've, th this technique ended up being kind of the, the foundational te technique for all of our ideas for um, uh, increasing sparsity and cutting down power and not having a proportional increase in um, tracking error. So based on just this principle, we built our first device um, in 2014, and it was based on the imagers that Deepak mentioned from Sentai. So we had a couple of low-power cameras. We had this relatively efficient algorithm. It has some downsides, um, but overall, we were able to get very low power consumption. And what you're looking at is a comparison of the eyeshadow with some of the devices that Deepak mentioned earlier. So the Tobi is kind of a standard industry tracker. Eye Gaze is an academic uh, eye tracker that came out of Mobicom a couple of years back. And then um, so you can see compared to those devices, we're much, much lower in terms of power consumption. But when you look at actual popular wearables like a Fitbit, we're still at way too high of a budget for something that uh, compared to things that people actually wear on a regular basis. Another issue we kind of have is accuracy in terms of eye tracking. So again, compared to um, some of our neighbors in this area, we're doing all right. Um, uh, three or five degrees of error is acceptable for most things. Um, or acceptable for a lot of gaze tracking um, general object tasks. But compared to something like a standard like the Tobi, we're still way too high of error. So we set ourselves up with the goal of increasing the accuracy of our system without increasing the power. In fact, we want to bring the power down even further. So the way we pursued that was to increase the sparsity more since that had gotten us this far. And at the same time, we needed to be getting more information per pixel to make up for that and still have, an, and have a simultaneous increase in accuracy. Um, and our first thought there was to decrease the noise in the image somehow. Um, <clears throat> and so in order to decrease the noise, we turned to um, a, a technique called uh, near-infrared illumination. And for those of you who don't know, uh, because of some properties of the eyeball, near-infrared interacts with it in such a way as to make the pupil much and the other features of the eye much clearer to a camera. And I want to emphasize that this is completely safe. Um, your eye gets exposed to near infrared from sunlight at much higher levels than we do with our device. Um, and we're putting it uh, very low power, the lowest we can get away with and still get any illumination. So compared to the system power budget, uh, it's barely any increase at all. And you can see here on the right hand side, 
um, at the top is without infrared illumination and the bottom is with, and you can see just the massive increase in quality we get right away. So the next step was to figure out a new model that would take advantage of this new level of clarity in the image. Um, and so let me run through quickly what we came up with, which we called the cross model and is a part of our new pipeline. So suppose that instead of having an actual image of the eye or a sense of all the structures of the eye, what you just have is a probabilistic idea of where you expect the pupil to be. Um, we represent it here as a point cloud. So the most efficient sampling mechanism we found was to sample a row and a column that meet in the middle at the highest point in this probability distribution and only read those pixels. So you can see here, just those are revealed. Um, so you can hopefully see in the middle here, you've captured part of the pupil, but you're not dead center. But that actually turns out to be enough. Even with these few hundred pixels, all we, uh, we have enough information to identify the different regions of the eye within the image. So the white, the iris, the pupil, and that ends up being enough to localize the center of the pupil. And so with, this, with these new possibilities, we were able to put together a more advanced pipeline, which we call it CIDR. And let me walk through the different stages of it real quick. Uh, this is a simple search refine controller. So it has two primary pieces. The first one is the search stage, um, which just kind of localizes your target. In this case, it's we're using a neural network model uh, that's been trained to identify the center of the pupil. Um, and compared to the cross model, it's a little slower, but it's much more robust in its performance. So we use that to get an initial estimate of the eye position and then use the cross model that I just explained to refine it. And it's much faster and tends to be more accurate. Um, and so when it's when it operates successfully, when it's able to find the pupil, you get a good estimate of the pupil center and size, and then you're able to feed that back into the cross model the next frame and update the center and just continue iteratively tracking the eye in this way. Now, it can lose track due to a blink or um, uh, illumination changes. There's a few different things that can do it. When that happens, it just drops back to the neural network very quickly, reboots, and then begins tracking again. And there's also um, an issue, as I mentioned earlier, sunlight has a lot of infrared energy, and that changes the dynamics of the system in a few important ways that I'm not going to get into. But I will just mention that we have a near-infrared illuminator, or excuse me, not an illuminator, a near-infrared diode that detects that extra energy when you step outside, and then um, changes the properties of our controller so that it can handle this new dimension. So now if we look at, um, we add CIDR to this comparison, you can see we've succeeded in our goal. We brought the power down another order of magnitude um, while increasing the accuracy to be within a comparable range to uh, devices like the Tobi. And now we're also within range of what's kind of the standard level of power consumption for these typical wearable devices. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to quickly talk through the process of how you would set up a new first-time user. Um, so you'd start by collecting calibration data, which basically just means um, a video of the, uh, the person's eye moving around, either looking at a target or just doing a normal task. Um, and if you're doing pupil tracking, for example, you'll label these label the individual frames. We have some software tools set up to do that. And then once you have the labels, it's standard supervised learning. So you just pass the images and the labels into a neural network trainer. It builds the model parameters. And all you have to do is load those to the glasses and you're ready to go. So I'm going to talk quickly about some results um, from our most recent paper. So as I've said, there's um, uh, an inherent trade-off in the system that you can control of <clears throat> number of pixels sampled versus the accuracy of the system. And so as you take um, no, actually, I apologize. This is a different graph. So what you have here is um, you can trade off the tracking rate, excuse me, of the system against the total power consumed. So if you want to go faster, um, uh, you'll consume more power. If you're okay with going slower, you can insert sleeps and do duty cycling and not consume as much power and let the system last longer. So on the lower end here, if you're just interested in doing um, coarse-grained gaze tracking, you can run the system as slow as 4 hertz and get power consumption as low as the 7 milliwatts we've mentioned. And that, on the, on the, for context, if you had a battery the size of the one on Google Glass, you could run for days at a time at this rate. 
If you care much more about fine-grained saccadic movements, we can crank it up to about two, 300 hertz. Um, and the power does increase, but not proportionally so. So you will lose a little bit of life, but you could still run it for, say, an entire day at a time. Ah, here we go. So as I said, there's an inherent trade-off between the number of pixels sampled and the error. Um, and you can see here that performance trade-off. Um, we have a nice, again, a performance elbow right about the seven milliwatts mark. And there we have about a pixel of tracking error, which corresponds in our system to about a third of a degree. Um, and this is just over a data set of 10, 15 users that we collected for our paper. And I'm gonna thank you for your time and pass it back to the All right, so so um, let me, uh, you know, before I can we conclude, um, let me just mention briefly some of the things that are, that are ongoing um, with eyeshadow here. Um, so on the device side, some of the things that we're working on um, involve just trying to fit the, get the form factor right. Um, you know, we got the power down, uh, you know, but but the the eyeglass form factor is actually quite a complicated, uh, you know, sort of a form factor to deal with. It's it's. And like many other form factors that one has to deal with when it comes to wearables, um, this one, you can't, you know, there are very few places where you can actually position a camera and not obstruct the field of view of the user. Ideally, um, you want these cameras to be embedded in the frame of the eyeglass. Uh, but that means that you may or may not have an, a view of the eye from the position or the vantage point that you would like. Um, so this is a problem. This is one of the problems which I think uh, has also limited sort of that transition where in the in the lab settings you can afford to have sort of a device that doesn't look pretty um, but is functionally uh, you know but, but functions as an eye tracker but in the field you want something that actually looks like a pair of um, spectacles and so the big target here is trying to get these cameras to actually go in the frame and so what that means is you have to have uh, Sort of these flexible boards that actually sort of try to embed the the cameras within the frame, and this is our first generation of that flexible board on the left there. Um, but once you embed these cameras in the frame, you don't actually get a full picture of the eye. And so, what we've been trying to deal with is uh, you know different partial pictures of the eye, and fusing all of that in trying and trying to infer the same things that we've been trying to infer, but from this kind of a uh, system setup. And sort of along those lines, there's there's other things that we're tackling as well. On the device side, um, on the uh, sort of more um, application side, if you will, um, the question is: Well, we we can get these measures um, from my shadow, um, and the question is: Can you take these measures and start trying to predict, a, uh, you know, a, a state, um, a mental, you know, a cognitive state like fatigue, um, in real time from that? So, so, um, and again, that. You know, we've had various discussions with uh, um, people at MD2K and, and outside, and and about different types of fatigue. Fatigue obviously is a very loaded word. It could mean cognitive fatigue. It could mean physical fatigue. Um, it could mean fatigue from pain, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, and there are interesting questions here. But there are interesting questions here in terms of how far you can take the measures from the eye uh, and, and tr start trying to predict these in real time. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, I'd have to thank uh, many people who've uh, who've worked over the years on the project. Only some of whom, some of the students are actually shown here. Um, I mean, many, many, you know, a lot of work has gone into the device side, for example, um, because I think this is our third generation of third generation device, um, and uh, the the nature of the the form factor of it, and the fact that you're dealing with bare cameras, um, and sort of odd positioning of these of these sensors and the processing elements has meant uh, you know that many people both in LA in the engineering side and the computing side have worked on it. So um, some of the students are shown on the top here: Soha, Pan, Yamin, Connor. Um, several faculty have also uh, you know worked with us on this. Um, Benjamin Marlin uh, on the machine learning side, um, Christopher Salthouse on the more device side of things, and so I'd like to thank them as well. All right, so at this point, I think uh, we are happy to take any questions. Well, Deepak, uh, Addison, this is uh, very, very fascinating. Uh, I was uh, very, I was thinking very broadly about uh, 
the applications of you know being able to quantify eye movements and uh, naturalistic viewing, uh, particularly with a focus on cognitive activity, you know, elders, Alzheimer's, dementia. Uh, the other thing that came to mind is this big issue of uh, disconjugate uh, eye movements, uh, particularly with uh, spokes injuries, traumatic brain injury, mild mild brain injury. So. It looks like uh, what you're doing is uh, will be wonderful for a whole bunch of different disciplines who may not quite be aware of what you're doing. So thank you for sharing your uh, expertise and insights with us. Uh, I, I want to open it up to the other members who are on this webinar. Are there any questions for Deepak or Addison? Let, let, let me step back and say, uh, Deepak, are you working with any of the neurologists uh, on, uh, on, you know, neurological functioning? Have, have... Not, not, yes, I think it's a very, it's a very good question. I think we've, we've, uh, we've uh, uh, you know, I think we've waited to some extent until we have a robust um, measures from the eye, because I think, uh, but, but you're absolutely right in that, in that uh, the next step is really looking with working with neurologists on this, but we haven't started so far. I see. The other other members, are there any questions? <laughs> uh, hey, this is Mahbub. Um, I have a, I have a question on on the accuracy. So if we yeah, did you try collecting data from different kind of colors, skin colors, people? I mean, pigmentation can have effect on the accuracy, right? I mean, I'm just thinking, do you have any comment on that direction? Yeah, sure. Uh, we get that one a lot, actually. So, in our original work, there was a little bit of an issue, but actually, um, with the near infrared illumination cancels out the uh, eye color almost completely because what we do is we filter out the visible and then when you're looking only at the infrared all pupils look effectively the same color um, and the skin color and pigmentation has not really given us an issue because as of right now we don't use that information for anything um, as we're getting into a little bit more um, with blinks and things it may be mm -hmm. something we have to deal with but just in terms of eye tracking it hasn't been a problem at all okay thank you Deepak, I was very curious. So you are tracking is entirely so personal, uh, and and so do you have any thoughts on the privacy issues? How accepting will be uh, people wearing these glasses when they know some very uh, personal aspects are being tracked? Yeah, I think the yeah you know the privacy question is another loaded one, right? So um, one. One, you know, something that I should mention is is that is that um, the videos of the eye that we are extracting uh, are not the are just for uh, demo demonstration purposes. So in reality, the way eyeshadow works is it's just getting a bunch of pixels from here and there in the eye, and uh, nobody, you know, you know, it's not it's not like you're getting videos of the eye directly. So in terms of if Somebody is worried about well, are you get, are you extracting videos of the eye and shipping it off to your phone, and will videos of my eye get posted on YouTube or wherever else? Uh, that is not the case because uh, there are we are sampling, subsampling the the you know the image to an extent where I don't think there's going to be no virtually no information about the entire eye that's going to be visible. So so you know from the inward facing camera perspective, um, you know we are extracting very few pixels. In order to extract, in order to um, sort of obtain the various measures of the eye um, that I've, you know, we've discussed in this in this uh, talk. So, um, so I think there's no there's no real privacy issue in that in that context. Now, the privacy issues obviously kick in when that information information about where the eye is looking or the state of the eye is combined with the state of the outside world, uh, because clearly at that point. Uh, you can start inferring things about 
you know, where somebody's looking, um, and you know, and and that may or may not be, and you know, that's clearly personal information. So that is that's that's that that's there. Um, and and so uh, you know, I don't have a good answer to that one, and I think it will be case by case, uh, depending on the severity of the condition and the nature of the test. So for example, if it's a controlled test in which uh, people are looking at gaze patterns, um, and and you know the disconjugate eye movement patterns, for example, that you mentioned. Uh, you know, it, well, actually, disconjugate eye movements can be done just with the inward-facing cameras. But in certain cases, you might sort of combine first-person vision together with eye movements, and in those cases, the privacy issues can you know, can come up. In the cases where you're just using the inward-facing cameras, I don't think there's any privacy issues. It's it's equivalent to any other health tracker, like a you know a, a pulse oximeter, where you're shining a light and then getting a sense of the pulse. So it's it's almost equivalent to that. Deepak, Addison, I want to thank you both uh, for distilling down all your years of uh, work and expertise into this very uh, accessible uh, lecture for us today. Thank you for making the time to join our webinars, and uh, we hope to have you back sometime in the future to give us an update. So thanks again, and I uh, uh, want to say goodbye to you. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.